anything that you have encountered that you felt that uh, okay this doesn't make sense this is not practical and uh, even stupid i would say a lot of the nft collections <laughs> no, no real technology no real backing no real this no real that it's just basically hey bro let's have some fun or hey bro you're going to get right a land by the end of the year i'm like okay what are you really doing yeah i feel that's uh, that's just a waste of a lot of resources okay so we are talking about teams and team culture and team building so do you have any stories that you would like to tell us any fun story late nights those are always the fun Hello everyone. I am here with another podcast from the platform of Techstar magazine. I am Aisha and I will be your host today. And we have uh, a guest from the tech industry and he is doing very great in blockchain and metaverse space. We have Javier Calderon today. Yeah. Hello Javier, how are you doing? I am doing great. Can you introduce yourself? Okay. My name is Javier Calderon. I am the chief of innovation at Disruptive and also the Chief Technology Officer at Meta Engine. I'm span across two different companies, one within it more in the AI space and the other one within the metaverse as a whole. Okay, so if we go back a little, can you please tell us what was your first venture and how it all started? In business and life, it's kind of difficult to say, but I'd say my first real venture was in the military. Where I spent a good amount of time just working on any technology and making sure that things were actually running properly for everybody around the world. It was an invigorating experience across that in my early career. And then going on outside of the military, it's I would say it started actually in marketing data and anal analytics breaking, where I was able to scale multiple businesses. to become seven figure to even eight figure businesses within a matter of a few months. Moving on from that, when I got into my early stages in the blockchain, I was developing smart contracts as early as 2017 and just deploying them to see if they were actually said that was viable. To where now I'm like even developing pads to technology on top of the blockchain. Even actually today and yesterday I've been diligently working on this new from a smart contract that can truly validate more of the legal contract side of things. And currently with Disruptive, we are working on a wide spread of technologies just within the AI space alone and even some really close and tight knit partnerships. Okay so how we we know that uh, startups and businesses they are not a fun thing to do it's not a very smooth ride and it is a roller coaster ride of emotions and uh, ups and downs so how do you manage that it's pretty simple it's pretty simple actually it's just to have fun yeah it's, it wasn't nothing like crazy it's just for me it was i just like having fun working in tech if i'm not having fun and i'm not interested I think it was through my military career to where I learned quickly that nothing is a fun journey. So for me, I tend to have the expectation of everything's going to be terrible, and as soon as it's not terrible, I'm like, this is awesome. And even if there's like really difficult experiences, I actually enjoy those more because of the hardships, especially with the people I'm working closely with. To where if say everything explodes in our faces if something doesn't really work out the way we planned. I actually enjoy those moments more because the most difficult and most hardest days in your life are normally the most the days you look back on the most. I wanted to ask about your theory that uh, you believe that everything is ninety percent research and ten percent work. So, how this philosophy has helped you in uh, making things more smooth for you, and uh, in guaranteeing your success, and uh, how it has helped you helped you in avoiding any failure or any mistakes in whatever you do. For me, generally, that's been my approach to just about anything in life. I think, for as long as I can remember. Reason being, it's as soon as you actually start understanding who you're working with, who are the people that are around you, and even who the who and what they're looking for. and you take the time and diligence on what they actually want to need even if it's something that you got like a quick send and saying hey i want to figure out how to make this ai tool that can talk to me about my feelings 
then for me, okay, they just send me like a message, say like over WhatsApp or something. And I could just more go across researching like, okay, these are all the unique tools that are doing it. Let's see what kind of cognitions they could be looking for as soon as I jump on the next call of them. So this way, once I hop on that call, I know precisely what to answer if they don't fully understand even the question they have themselves. Because for me, I'm more specialized across just finding out a solution to what is considered not even possible. And research, it's a very heavy factor on anything. So that definitely uh, saves time and uh, this is some useful insight. Okay, so moving on, moving on, I have a kind of generic question for you. Um, obviously, you have been in the blockchain industry for so long, but uh, can you tell us any one feature or any um, any technology in this space that has attracted you the most? Is there any feature that you about blockchain that you think is dominating other features? Right now, I think it's I've been really interested in the account bound tokens and also just setting up rental processes on top of the blockchain. That being said, for the account bound tokens, more it's that it's basically making any NFT into its own wallet or any token at that matter. And that's been actually having my extensive attention on it to see how it can be better structured to do even more. Even with actually thinking about it now too, even with the rollout of account abstraction or smart wallets, those have actually been kind of blowing my mind of how you can actually fully set up a network of wallets to actually identify one singular person. And uh, on the opposite side, uh, we know that blockchain uh, space is uh, very huge and there is a lot of potential. There are a lot of possibilities in this. So is there anything that you have encountered encountered that you felt that, uh, okay, this doesn't make sense, this is not practical and uh, even stupid? I would say a lot of the NFT collections. <laughs> Most of them being TFPs, it's like, okay, <laughs> you're only as good as your community. After that, it's kind of dead because there's no real, no, no real technology, no real backing, no real this, no real that. It's just basically, hey, bro, let's have some fun. Or, hey, bro, you're going to get a ride of land by the end of the year. I'm like, okay, what are you really doing? Yeah, I feel that's, uh, that's just a waste of a lot of resources and a uh, waste of time, actually. <laughs> Uh, uh, mm. There is another question that is relevant to this. So you have been in a lot of startups and you have been doing a lot of stuff yourself too. So um, how do you assess any Web3 or crypto startup? Like what criteria do you have in your mind? So because we know that there are a lot of projects out there that do not have any significant use case. So there is no speculation, there is no stable coin or any payments involved and uh, there is no use case. So how do you judge that this startup is going to be a success or this direction is going to be a success? Normally for me, how I actually assess that is reviewing what they have under the hood. Like what kind of data is there really any documentation if they've actually done the research and that the team does fully understand what they're working with with the technology. Because just making a simple Web3 project is not that difficult to do. You could easily open up, say, using open up an application using Third Web within the same day, and already have something live. And say it's a Web three project, but it's realistically like, what are you really doing under the hood to make it actually something viable? Like, what is the tooling? What is going to be happening? What's occurring in terms of actually making something work and actually getting people to use this technology that actually serves them a purpose? I guess that is very important because uh, we know that with the rising concerns about environment and about sustainability mm -hmm. and the emission levels that are associated with blockchain and NFT and minting, this is really a concern that people are investing in so many NFT collections and in so many projects and startups out there that are really not serving any purpose. So I guess this is very important for all of us that we need to think that if some technology is actually going to save us, is actually going to have a purpose, or we are just making things and just throwing them out and they are just making a bad impact. You have already mentioned that you have been uh, jumping from one startup to another, or actually you are working on more than one startup at a time. 
So how do you manage this? So how do you balance your time? And how do you know that uh, which project is worthy of your attention and time? And uh, so because there are a lot of people out there right now who are doing more than one project at a, at a time. So they would definitely like to know your insights and your way of work. Time boxing and also actually setting up your schedule to make sure it actually fits with everything that needs to be done across every project. And through that, also making sure you you select distinct days to focus on one specific project that might require more attention in comparison to another project that could require a little less. Because not every single project requires like super high level attention. It's just a matter of when it actually does need the attention. Similar processes to what Elon Musk does across all his companies with SpaceX, Tesla, and also Twitter. No, I want to make sure that every single team member is aware that it's, you have to be a bit scrappy and make sure that you're quickly able to maneuver to doing another task and something that might not be something core to gear towards what you're supposed to be doing, but you're agile enough to work on it. Cause that's kind of the core composition of any startup is that everybody has to be a bit agile to do something a little bit different from what they're supposed to do mainly, but ultimately it's a matter of just getting everybody to work as a whole, as a team, and just to come together to build something incredible. And it's not about going to corporate route that some startups might try to do, like try to become a huge conglomerate, which doesn't really make sense. It's a matter of actually building something that works and actually showing the world that, hey, we got something that's actually working. Because that's something that a lot of these startups do miss the mark on. Yeah, because with that, I've noticed many, many startups missing the mark on that to where if they actually took more time to work and develop the product, even if it's something that's not fully built internally and they just released it and actually had it actually working and generating revenue, then this would actually make life a lot easier for more startups from what I've noticed, because some of them do try to become more enterprise level or industry level at such an early stage, knowing me from experience that with that kind of stuff, it does come with enterprise level costs. Okay, so we are talking about teams and team culture and team building. So do you have any stories that you would like to tell us? Hmm. Any fun story? Late nights. Those are always the fun. The fun is science. Could be just locked in a room with like half the team just working on finishing a specific project where you could be like actually having screwdrivers and everything ready to go to like install some software into this physical piece of hardware which I wish I could talk about it, but to keep it short and simple for that, I'd say just doing all that and working like late into the evening up until four or five or six in the morning with the team, it's game changing and life changing just because you actually get to become closer with every single team member knowing that the camaraderie is all there and it makes everybody actually stronger and more trusting with each other as a whole. We would also like your thoughts on work from home culture. What are the pros and what are the cons? I love remote work. I think the biggest con is actually finding a good setup of where you want to be comfortable working. Like I'm pretty sure you've come across this to where like you might be holding up, have your laptop with you and you're like, okay, I want to work here. I want to work there. Like say you could be in an apartment, you could be in a coffee shop, you could be in some co-working space. It's kind of hard to find actually a good spot to where it's like comfortable, quiet, and actually just set for you. I think that's actually the harder part about working remote. That's also so even making sure you're accommodating and accomplishing every single task without somebody micromanaging you in comparison to say working at an office. It's a mix, honestly, because even me with what I do, sometimes half the team is actually traveling to where I'm going. So half the time the remote work is work being brought to another city or state like right now after this call i'll be heading to las vegas to meet up with the team for this investor event and we'll likely have late nights tonight <laughs> up until the weekend make sure you have plenty of coffee and bring coffee bags with you anywhere you go
Okay, so have you? We would like to conclude this discussion uh, on you giving some advice of how uh, you think that our youth and the young entrepreneurs should come forward, and what should be their strategy. And uh, do you have any advice? Do you have any way forward for that? I'd say more towards the entrepreneur side because I think that's what I have been geared towards. So I'd say if going the entrepreneur right, be comfortable being lonely. And not everybody's going to come with you to the top. No matter how you look at it, everybody that's next to you might not be going to the same place you are, and that's fine. Everybody has their own path. The game of life, as I call it, the fine game of nil. It's just a matter of just making sure you live the life you want to live. If this is the path you want to take as an entrepreneur, do it. And I don't recommend it to anybody, actually, because it's not easy and it's very, very lonely at times. But it's actually, it's very rewarding and it's the most beautiful thing you can do if you actually do accomplish it. And none of, it's not going to be easy going to the top. There's some periods where you might have clients that don't pay you. There's some periods where you might be dealing with people who are just extremely difficult. And generally speaking, it's just a lot of work building something that you don't even know it's going to make you money. But if you stay consistent, committed, and actually working towards building that solution, at the end of the tunnel, there's always light. I would like to conclude this discussion on the point that being consistent is the key. And uh, this, is an, this is an advice for everyone around us. So I, it was very nice to have you on this podcast. And uh, we definitely have a lot of advice and a lot of wise words from you. And it was very nice to have you. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you so much for giving us your time. So we would come back again with another podcast and with another tech star. <laughs>